Hi everyone, this is Duncan from the podcast Under the Stairs. This particular video you're checking out just now has the archival recording attached to it. The archival recording is from our podography, I think that's the term that we use, um, and it will feature reviews of movies that fall under the 88 Films Italian Collection series. Now, the vast majority of reviews we've done over the last five years have been in audio format and published on our RSS feed for the podcast. We are transitioning over to give you access to all those reviews right here on YouTube under a playlist. Now, we're doing that because we're about to do our first video recording of E88 Films Italian collection release, that being Tentacles. So there's plenty of opportunity to delve into the back catalogue of the reviews here. And if you like what you hear, then please hit subscribe on the channel, leave your comments below, and uh, check out the rich catalogue of over 1,200 episodes we have on podcasts under the stairs on any podcatching device or Spotify that you use. So stick around, enjoy the episode, and I'll speak to you very soon. Are you Tiger Sharp? You hit him once more, and I swear I'll destroy him. You have no proof. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a son of a bitch. Was to be left alone. And don't try just to hit him. Shoot to kill. I'll take care of that. My brother started it all. Hi, Tig. I'm sorry for what they did. Me too, Tom. But I always pay my debts. Why? There's just no answer to violence. Look, I know it's all you've been doing for the last eight years, but think about it. The consequences? No! No, no! No! no. You know what this means? There's only one way you're gonna stop Tiger now. Kill him. Or else he's gonna rip us all apart. One by one. Give me this chance. You said we're all in the same boat. Every one of you could end up with a ticket to the chair. Welcome back. So you've just heard the trailer for disc number four of the 88 Films Italian Collection. This is Blast Fighter from 1984, directed by the great Lamberto Bava, making his first appearance into this series of reviews. And I'll just stress right up front, it won't be his last. Bava appears on quite a lot. Now, you've heard me talk about Bava quite a bit on podcasts under the stairs. You may be thinking... Any relation to Mario Bava? Yeah, this guy is his son. This is his son keeping it in the family, keeping the dream alive. So, um, yeah, this is Blast Fighter, like I say, from 1984. Now, according to the 88 Films website, we get a little bit of blurb. Love reading the blurb from these things. It says, Quentin Tarantino maintains that Blast Fighter is the best movie the legendary Lamberto Bava has ever called action on. And who are we to argue with? Well, I would argue with that because the guy did demons and... Yeah, might drop. Anyway, back to the blurb. It says, Ultimately, this blistering bout of sweaty, sanguine-stained action horror is one hell of an exciting ride, as an ex-jailbird seeking little more than a quiet life in the wilderness finds his scenic ideal invaded by some vicious redneck poachers. In response, blood is spilled, bullets are fired, and the real prey becomes man. In this raucous mix of first blood and the backward shocks of deliverance and southern comfort. Also highlighting a cast of Italian genre icons, including Michael Sopke uh, from Massacre in Dinosaur Valley, Valentia Forti 
from Cut and Run and George Eastman from Anthropopacus. Blast Fighter makes his worldwide Blu-ray debut uncut and uncensored from 88 films. Now the Blu-ray itself uh, comes with the standard things that appear in the 88 films thing so you get like a postcard which collects with a number. Uh, this one contains only one interview which is with the cinematographer Gio, uh, Gian Lorenzo Batilga. My pronunciation of Italian names is absolutely fucking horrendous so apologies up front. Um, but yeah, it's, it's actually a really good interview where they, they kind of talk about his collaborations specifically with Baba, but some of the work he did with some of the other directors um, that were featured as actors in this movie. Because that's the beauty of watching Italian genre uh, films from this time, is you, you're just faced with a plethora of people that either went on to star in more movies like George Eastman, or people that went on to star as directors of their own movies moving forward through the 80s and into the 90s, so tons of that there. Out with that, you get trailers for all the previous movies and the list and some of the upcoming ones, which I felt was a bit of a cop-out, so there isn't actually an official trailer for Blast Fighter on the disc. Not entirely sure why they did that. And as is becoming a theme with a lot of these 88 films releases in the collection, the the extras are a bit sparse. Um, which I'm not going to overly complain about because you can pick up this movie currently for about £8 directly off the website. So for £8, you know, I'm not going to grumble that you get a Blu-ray, which is, I think it's a 2K restoration in the extent of this one, and you're not getting much in the way of special features. I just feel that maybe some of these titles are being rushed out without the, the necessary time needed to collect things in the background. So like I said, this is a first time watch for me, and I can't stress how fucking bonkers this movie is. Uh, the description as kind of reminiscent of things like Southern Comfort, um, of Deliverance, of Rambo are certainly in there. There are shades of Death Wish as well, kind of peppered throughout the movie. It's straight up fucking bonkers, but I'm going to be honest with you guys, I kind of love this movie. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about the nonsense of it. As a first time watch, I kind of sat in my bed last night watching the movie and just let it wash over me in a way which made me feel like this, in so many levels, um, is not a well put together movie, that uh, there's so many subplots that turn out to be nothing, there's so many things that should be pivotal in the storylines which are really not that interesting at all, but by god does every five minutes not something happen which kind of makes you go, alright we're getting a bit more backstory here, alright this is why he's doing it and the constant need to find out what it will take for our lead character, Tiger, that's right, fucking Tiger, how bitching is that for a name? To pick up the giant fucking gun he got at the beginning of this movie. All the way through it was just like, pick up the gun. Pick up the gun. Um, it was, it's kind of fucking amazing. So strap yourselves in and get ready for me to take you through the plot. Now you will think at times that your brain has maybe wandered off slightly and you've missed a bit of pivotal information. Do not press the back button on your iPod or any MP3 playing device that you listen to this. Don't think you've missed nothing guys. You've missed nothing. I have not missed segments. This is the plot. The movie follows Tiger, uh, whose real name is Jake Sharp, but goes by the name Tiger. A police officer who has just come out of doing an eight year sentence for killing a criminal. Um, we'll get back to that in a minute. But he comes out and he meets his lawyer. <laughs> Uh, in a car and his lawyer gives him this prototype for this illegal weapon which is not in the market at the moment which is if you've seen the cover artwork for this episode that's the gun he's carrying it's this giant fucking almost futuristic looking ray gun with a massive sight on the front of it um, Tiger takes to the rooftops and looks like he's going to kill this guy who we find it later on is I think he's the attorney general but he doesn't do it he can't shoot um, he has mellowed in his um, his time away in prison and has decided that he is now going to go to his hometown where he grew up back in the American countryside up in the hills and so he, he goes off there he's bought a cabin he's got a way back to live in the wilderness now it's worth saying that Jake Tiger Sharp um, or Tiger as I will just call him from now on he uh, used to be a cop, he was a cop for 9 years and uh, was ultimately sentenced for killing 
who he claims is a bad guy, once again we'll come back to what that actually means. So he returns back to his hometown, things have changed slightly. Um, when he arrives there he is going to pick up some of his groceries and we see a very familiar face of a guy holding a banjo. It is in fact the dude from Deliverance still holding a banjo, a couple of years older. Um, it's worth noting that this film was actually shot on location in the same part of the world that Deliverance was shot, which plays into the kind of Deliverance tones of the movie. There's an altercation with some kind of rowdy rednecks uh, who he ultimately decides to, to kind of let things pass by, everything's cool, doesn't really want to be involved with the nonsense. Uh, later on he's out, he's got his fucking futuristic gun with him and he looks like he's going to do a spot hunting and he finds a deer but can't shoot the deer either because he's a non-violent man. Tiger doesn't want to hurt anything that's living. He's a, he, you know, he's, he's done his time, he's off the fucking grid, he's living the dream. He's in a place where there is no Facebook, ladies and gents. No Facebook, no Twitter. He's he's off the grid. Um, he finds that these guys, these redneck hicks that he bumped into earlier on are going around shooting deer but not killing them, not putting them down. So they're basically left to die this horrible, slow death. And he takes exception to that. So he uh, kills the deer, putting a stop to their, their want, so to speak. And he finds his baby deer, a doe, um, a deer, a female, shut up. Uh, so uh, kind of we, we get this kind of loving montage of him looking after the deer, takes it to town with him, which I would suggest is a bad thing considering you know that there's arseholes in the town, but he takes the, the doe into town with him and he is away getting some stuff for the deer to rear it, like a, like a baby bottle, etc. And he comes back and when he opens the door to his vehicle, its throat has been slit by these fucking rednecks and I think in my head right enough's enough Tiger is about to go bush but he doesn't really he kicks the shit out of them a little bit and uh, we find him in a bit of trouble with the police he's about to pay for the damage he's caused to the town and we are introduced to Tom a guy that grew up with Tiger back in the day Tom is played by the great George Eastman we will be discussing George Eastman in depth quite a bit as this 88 film series goes along. He starred in a ton of movies, a lot of Joe D'Amato movies, but we'll get to that, like I say, when we touch on those movies, most notably things like Absurd or Anthropopagus, but that's for another time. Tom and a Tiger grew up together. Tom now owns the local lumber mill, walks with a weird limp, and um, kind of stresses to Tiger that the, the ringleader of these rednecks is his brother, kind of apologises, puts his money down to pay for things and uh, Tiger's like, no, I always pay my debts, it's cool, you just keep your brother away and everything will be okay. So there's already a bit of tension there, it looks like Tom kind of runs the ruffians in the town and um, Tiger goes back to his shack where he meets um, just this girl who has just fucking shown up, um, played by uh, Valencia Forte, uh, she is Connie who is this girl that has tracked down Tiger. Now, I will say there's a lot of stretching you have to do in the terms of disbelief to kind of get what is going on in this movie because this whole subplot doesn't really go to anything except set up the ultimate reason why Tiger will go gun crazy at the last 15 minutes. That being said, um, she shows up. There's a bit of kind of comical back and kind of turn and thrown with them throughout the plot. Tiger decides that he doesn't want her around anymore after um, they, they kind of spend the night together. Not that way. This is an old boy. You'll see why I said that in a second. Uh, and the following day, he takes her out the car to drive her back to town when he realises there is something wrong with his brakes. His brakes have been cut, ladies and gents, probably by those pesky rednecks. Uh, we get our kind of pretty hilarious kind of car scene where they jump out at the last minute, roll out the car as the car falls off, the cliff bursts into flames. The flames can be seen from the town that the rednecks think that they've managed to get rid of Tiger. They show up and Tiger gets rid of their van. And then we're in this kind of, we're going to hike through the woods sort of deliverance scene as they make the gingerly hike across a hill back to Tiger's cabin. Tiger and Connie, when they arrive, see that 
two people have shown up. One of them is the lawyer who has shown up inexplicably for no reason at all. Uh, the other one is Pete, who is training to be a local forest ranger. Pete is played by Michelle Suave, um, who is the, like, you're going to hear a lot of love for this guy. Once again, probably mispronounced his name, but this is the director of Stage Fright uh, of the church. And most notably, if you're me, Cemetery Man, Del Morte, Del Morte. Oh, I love that movie so much. Um, but yeah, let's let's bring back from back from the brink, ladies and gents. Back from the brink. Um, upon this journey back to the cabin where they meet Pete and his his lawyer, uh, it is revealed that Connie is actually the daughter of Tiger. Now, she was eight when he went in, which means that she's now 16 years old. If we're doing the math right. And Tiger does not recognise her. There is something wrong with that. You know, he doesn't recognise her at all facially. You know, and she literally looks like a mother. So once again, it doesn't make sense. We get some flashbacks to find out why Tiger did his time. He was getting a bit too close to some criminals who decided to take the law into their own hands. One in particular murdered Tiger's wife. Uh, and when Tiger went to kill said criminal, the district attorney arrived who was in league with this criminal, not stressed really to make much sense at all. It's also kind of hinted that maybe they're gay, but once again, that doesn't go anywhere. Tells him to put down his gun because he's got a rock hard alibi, maybe a rock hard something else, and um, Tiger shoots the criminal, which ultimately leads to him going away, which ultimately leads to that scene at the beginning where he got the gun and was about to take his vengeance out, but didn't do it, didn't pull the trigger. In a conversation with his lawyer, Tiger basically says, you know, my gun is not being used because I'm not into that anymore. I'm not a violent person now. We can solve things other ways. And everything looks like it's going okay until these flaming barrels bundle down the hill and destroy the, the camper van that Pete has brought with the lawyer. So they're still under attack by these rednecks. So they go down and camp out close to the water and Tiger is like, enough is enough. We're getting out of here. We're going to go home. I'm going to be like Gandhi. Non-violent protest. Uh, I'm going to leave. These guys have won. Fuck it. So he heads back into town. Bumps into his buddy Tom again. And the police officer basically says, you know, I want some, I want some wheels. We're leaving. Uh, gets a car. But in a conversation with Tom, it's kind of revealed that these two had some sort of weird, weird rivalry growing up. So much so that they did some sort of duel with each other, which involved them both having a gun with a, one bullet uh, to take out the other person, and Tiger had won the altercation, but instead of killing Tom, had shot him in the leg, which is why Tom walks with the limp. Did we see where we're going with this? So there's a bit of weird sort of animosity and respect, question mark, uh, between these two. As Tiger's going back to pick up these people, the rednecks have shown up, uh, and an altercation which looks like they're going to rape Connie, aka Deliverance style. Um, their, one of their guns goes off, kills the lawyer, and the rednecks go into panic. They want to try and make sure that there are no witnesses, because if there are no witnesses, there is no crime. Um, and they kill um, Pete. Pete dies, which is a bit of a shame. And uh, yeah, then they go to hunt down the Tiger's daughter. Tiger shows up just in time. And the two of them do a kind of Rambo-esque, Deliverance-style, evade, capture, run away from these rednecks. And now it's hunting season. Uh, the rednecks, who just appear to be like gremlins eating after midnight, just seem to multiply. So at first there's four of them, and then there's 12, and then there's about 20. By the end, there's an army of rednecks uh, hunting down Tiger. They start taking some pot shots. One of them shoots Connie in the leg, and... Tiger manages to protect her. Eventually, Tom arrives in a helicopter and agrees a truce, which his brother promptly breaks straight away by shooting at Connie and killing her, which gives us one of the greatest kind of shouting in the air montages of our day. Connie! Tiger has had enough. He heads back to his shack and gets his fucking gun. But meanwhile, we have a montage of awesome. A montage massacre as he walks his way through each of the henchmen, some using knives, some using guns, fucking snapping necks. He's running and doing front flips down hills like a gazelle. It's fucking hilarious. 
Um, he reaches back to his cabin, gets his gun, his fucking super powered gun, which apparently fires rockets, puts like shotgun cartridges that look like laser cannon things that blow up vehicles, and he just starts killing everyone. I mean, literally just starts fucking mauling everyone. Arms come off, vehicles explode. He kills them all, takes them all out. But right at the very end, when he kills the brother, Tom arrives. This is after Jake Tiger Sharp has smashed his gun off a tree, so his gun is now ruined. And Tom comes back, and then we get this idea of them reliving the battle that they had in their youth. Um, one is armed with a powerful weapon, that would be George Eastman playing Tom. The other one has a handgun, that is Tiger. Uh, Eastman takes his only shot, he's a cheeky bugger though because he's got two of these. He shot him, he takes his shot, misses, takes his second shot which clips Tiger in the arm. Tiger shoots his other leg, see what he's done there, crippling Tom in both legs. Then the two of them have this kind of conversation where they're like, yeah, well that's that. And then the last sequence is them driving into town with all the bodies in the vehicle as buddies. Yeah, you've missed nothing there. It's fucking bonkers to say the least. I could not believe the end and I was like, really? Is that how we're ending this movie? Everything's okay. Tiger's lost his daughter. You've lost his brother. Like a million people are dead. They're all in the back of the truck like dead deer. And we're just going to drive like we're buddies back into town. But that doesn't even take into account the weird subplots that don't really lead to anything. Why is his lawyer arming him with a futuristic weapon? Where did that come from? It's not explained. It's not explained at all. Um, what was going on with the, the daughter? Why did she hunt him down? How did she find out? We're assuming it's through the lawyer. Uh, but why, you know, Tiger had no interest in seeking out his daughter, who is isn't ostensibly um, being cared by grandparents. You know, it's his only, his only, only real blood relative. The rest of all, well, his wife has died, obviously. No interest. And how he didn't recognise her, it's not really summed up. Why Tom is so forgiven of what has happened with his brother doesn't really make sense. That ending is, like I say, almost laugh out loud hilarious. What this movie does have is tons of flashbacks, loads of action, um, and enough plot to make you go, what? Uh, throughout the movie that I kind of loved it. Uh, the locational shot, obviously, appearing delivering his country, aids the movie quite a bit. It's kind of not used to the same extent or cinematic sort of genius as you would get in Deliverance, but we can kind of live with that to an extent. The dubbing is hellish in this movie. Oh, I mean, like, really, 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 really bad. Even by kind of Italian genre film standards, the dubbing is pretty awful. Um, and I'm not sure why. You would think as time went on, that would be better. You know, those things would just get better. Technology gets better. Filming techniques get better. But no, no, no. I've seen movies from the 60s uh, from Italy that have been dubbed that are better dubbed than this. So, yeah, that was a bit frustrating to watch. Always a bonus to see Big Georgie spin in a movie. Kind of love that. Like, the same with Michelle Suave. Um, I love him, I think he's brilliant, and it's kind of cool to see him in this. Having a bit of fun in the role, uh, he's certainly not a demon in demons, but uh, yeah, he's having, he's having a, a bit of a wheel of a time. Um, they've, they landed a pretty impeccable like central man in this movie with uh, Michael Sopke, I think that's how you pronounce his name. He's fucking amazing. Um, so serious, chiseled chin, kind of looks like a, like a 70s kind of porn star version of Rambo or like a Swedish porn equivalent of Rambo like if Rambo was a Swedish porn film uh, they would get Tiger in the main role that's kind of what it looks like it's kind of amazing uh, the gun is ridiculous I'm sorry the gun is ridiculous which kind of leads us to the whole blast fighter thing um, so I, I thought the name sounded a bit strange and the, the artwork looked a bit too futuristic for this movie until you do a little bit of reading. So originally the movie was going to be directed by Lucio Fulci. It was going to be a follow-up to Warriors of the Year 2072, which didn't happen really all that well. Um, there was a bit of legal uh, fufara, so to speak. Um, and what happened was the title and premise 
uh, moved over to Bava to direct. However, the script stayed with Filchi, and as a result, they kept the name Blast Fighter, which makes sense for a kind of post apocalyptic, futuristic sort of action movie, um, as opposed to this. The name does not like even remotely, remotely resemble the title. That being said, it's still bitching nonetheless. Other things that are worth mentioning as well, the score on this movie, uh, done by Fabio Frizzi. I love Fabio Frizzi. Um, and it's a kind of synthy, over-the-top fucking nonsense thing that plays pretty much all the way through it, except for the kind of country disco song that was written by the Bee Gees, but not performed by the Bee Gees, which I think I'm going to play out this episode with if I can find a copy, because it's kind of fucking hilarious. Uh, and it plays loads as well. But the, the frizzy theme that kind of permeates through the movie is really, really cool. But once again, far too futuristic for this sort of movie. I mean, it is like literally, you would expect it to be the score to the next Terminator movie, as opposed to the score on this one. Maybe even a little bit of John Carpenter. Um, which, I mean, it makes sense to an extent, because this is Italy doing this rip-off genre thing, this splicing thing that they do where they take about two or three massive Hollywood movie ideas or conceits uh, from blockbuster movies and mash them in a blender to make one movie, in the case of this one, Blast Fighter. I did have a ton of fun with this movie. It has a, it has so many flaws, I lost count. But on pure entertainment value alone, which is what we're looking at here, I mean this is a, a schlocky B-movie action sort of subgenre Italian rip-off movie and by those weird credentials and those weird caveats it works so so well uh, it is a hoot so over the top like characters are dying our, our Rambo-esque hero doesn't give a fuck daughter dies we got a carny which I love doing um, and that's about it and then he goes on the rampage in the last like 15-20 minutes of this movie is well worth the £8 for the Blu-ray like alone I thought it was great I had so much fun with this one um, I think it's one of those ones where as an early movie in Lamberto Bava's career he kind of nails the absurdity of what's going on I mean this movie is ostensibly I think it's his third movie it's made the year before um and demons and a year after a blade in the dark so yeah the guy was on a bit of a roll and tackling all those different genres like all good italian directors are doing this is his kind of first foray into action and it's kind of amazing so yeah I, I had so much fun with this movie i would recommend it at least as a one-off watch like if you like goofy if you like over the top 80s action blast fighters your ticket man get yourself a seat to the party uh, pull up a chair and, uh, and joining the conversation it's kind of nuts and a whole hell of a lot of fun if I was to grade this one I'm giving it a 4 I think this is so much fun it's a really I really liked this movie I thought it was great and uh, yeah with all the caveats in place to do with this particular series of shows it's it's so much fun you're going you're to have a blast with this one I look forward to the conversations that spin, spin off from it uh, from people that have seen it before and those that are going to see it. So yeah, you're going to have a ton of fun watching Blast Fighter. So there we go. That's my review of this movie. That was disc number four.